like to call the meeting to order the Colchester Planning Commission. It is 7 o'clock. First order of business tonight is our wastewater project draft report presentation. I'll let Sarah take over on that one. All right, Thank good you. evening. Um, let me. There we go. Um, so I'll run through a quick presentation. Um, I, I think if you have any questions along the way, I'll try and take them um, as best as we can. However, there will be Q&A and comments at the end. So if you'll bear with me, I'll just give a quick overview of the project thus far, uh, how we got here, where we're going, and um, also feel free to chime in along the way. Um, I tried to make it brief and so a little bit about why we're here and how we got here. Um, at the select board meeting on March 26, 2019, uh, the select board requested the planning commission review and analyze options to address uh, the lack of effective wastewater disposal capacity for properties in the inner Malice Bay and report back their findings this fall. The issue of wastewater in the inner bay has had a long history, stretching back to the original 1967 town plan. 1999 sewer proposal was conserved by the community and defeated. The select board proposed a funding vote to the community to serve 289 properties along West and East Lakeshore Drive, as well as Good Sale Point with sewer on town meeting day, March 5th, 2019. The project was a derivative of a project that began under Fire District 2 to serve a larger and broader area. The 2019 vote was narrowly defeated. The inner bay has a continuing sustained presence of human wastewater. In a 2015 determination, the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation's Watershed Management Division stated the following. The division has examined E. coli sampling records from lakes and ponds throughout Vermont. While exceedances of this criteria are relatively common in streams and rivers, they are much rarer in lakes owing to the dilution and exposure of bacteria to ultraviolet light that is incident to the lake surface. The exposure to ultraviolet light is relevant as this accelerates the sustenance of bacteria rapidly under most circumstances. The record of repeating and regular E. coli bacteria exceedances during dry weather is uncommon in Vermont lakes and waters and suggests a higher than expected source signal in Mallets Bay. So a little bit about the Planning Commission's approach and uh, what we chose to sort of try and uh, tackle in the short time that we had. Um, the initial charge was provided to the commission after the failure of the vote to fund a proposal for a specific portion of the inner bay, 289 properties along west, east, and Good Cell Point. For the purposes of this report, the specific portion will be referred to as the inner bay. Um, the commission has understood its charge to be identify solutions for the same geographic area and to solicit as much community as Baldwin as possible in identifying solutions. All alternatives were open for consideration. So a little bit about some of the background, some of the studies and reports they looked at. The commission looked at previous reports and studies conducted as part of defining their investigation, including the 2013 Integrated Water Resources Management Plan. The IWRMP was completed for Colchester as part of a U.S. Environmental Protection Agency demo grant. This plan sought to comprehensively improve the overall management of non-point source pollution control infrastructure. The plan considered natural resources, current and future land uses of both the natural and built infrastructure, cumulative impacts to water quality. The plan identified the environmental and area constraints, conducted wastewater system assessments, created a wastewater needs assessment of priority areas, and provided wastewater management recommendations to the town, including an alternatives analysis of the possible solutions. The inner bay was comprised of mostly high risk areas with one medium risk area along the non lakeside portion of East Lakeshore Drive. The state constituted the highest level of wastewater investigation physically and legally possible and concluded that the best solution for the high risk area of the inner bay was sewer. Due to the proximity of the medium risk area, it was recommended that sewering this area was also a preferred solution of this plan. And you can see in the interceding years since this was completed, you see various staff, including myself, out in streams continuing to collect data and build off of it. So a little bit of where we started in May, we started with a kickoff. Uh, we had a wastewater forum, uh, as well as a walk and talk of the inner bay. Um, these events coupled with an online survey informed the commission as to community concerns and possible solutions. 
a town-wide mailing and ad and the Colchester Sun made the community aware of the May events. A postcard mailing in June updated the community on subsequent workshops. Attendees of the meeting were added to our Notify Me tool with our website um, to receive updates on the project. So following the May um, kickoff, walk and talk um, in survey, um, the commission met at the beginning of June. This is a, our June 4th meeting um, and met with our facilitator, Cindy Cook here um, and went through what we've heard. Many concerns were heard um, by the commission including but not limited to land conservation could be used to buy out property owners. Community septic should be examined as an alternative. Sewer could still be an option. Boaters might be contributing to the problem. Wildlife should be targeted for improvement. Upstream runoff was a source of pollution. Better enforcement of wastewater rules could be used to crack down on polluters with failed septics. And more studies could be done to further limit the area for the wastewater solution. Commission isolated four possible solutions to be evaluated out of that. Land conservation, community septic, sewer, and no action. Each would have a dedicated work session. Additional work sessions would be provided to help the community address concerns such as development impacts of wastewater rules and permitting. On June 4th, the commission set a course for the action for the project, adopting, adopting a decision matrix to evaluate solutions. The commission continued their discussion of this course of action, revisited it June 18th and periodically throughout future meetings. Our summer workshops. Commission set up a series of workshops to focus on the solutions and other community concerns, such as general information on septic systems on July 2nd and development concerns on August 6th. A workshop on land conservation was held on June 18th. A presentation on sewer occurred on July 30th. Presentation on community sewer occurred on August 20th, following wastewater information received during a work session on July 2nd. Um, the no action alternative was discussed on September 17th. We also undertook a tour of community septic systems um, on September 6th. We all got on a small bus together and toured some central Vermont and Charlotte towns of Sugarbush, Waitsfield, and Warren with a group of commissioners, Colchester staff, consultants, um, and members of the Colchester community. Throughout the process, a variety of experts were consulted by the commission, including Stone Environmental, Wait Hendel Environmental Management, Aldrich Elliott Associates, state wastewater officials, as well as Colchester staff. May officials from the state, municipalities, and private entities donated their time to assist Colchester in this project. Um, I was amazed at the people on our September 6th tour that took time out of their day to host and facilitate us. Um, very greatly appreciated. A little bit about our outreach. We solicited public input throughout the process with an interactive website with polling. The initial PlaySpeak website was developed to allow an online interactive forum, but unfortunately is perceived to be too complicated uh, and not user friendly. We abandoned this website in favor of a regular town website. Uh, presentations from the public workshops, information considered by the commission, including comments to the public are available on the town's website, linked through the tinyurl.com backslash Colchester MBI, we're live streaming tonight. There's a link on that website to where we're live streaming from. Videos of all the planning commission meetings, workshops, septic tours are also available on the website. We have a short video. We tried to take the whole day and churn it down into, I think it's about an hour uh, video on the website um, for the septic tour. Where locations permitted, we were live broadcasting with the ability for viewers to email in questions. Sun also provided coverage of many of the events. All right, so community concerns. We had a variety of community concerns that were voiced throughout the process, including about impacts to the character of the inner bay that could be caused by infrastructure such as sewer or community septic. There were concerns about the type and rate of development. The commission considered these development concerns at the August 6th meeting. While now a solution in the commission's role to administer the land use regulations could be used to address these concerns, and this is one of your future projects as identified in the town plan to look at specifically the East Lakeshore Drive area. Um, hopefully in the coming months, you will get to that. In evaluating community feedback throughout the project, the commission also noted many misperceptions held about septic systems, enforcement abilities of the town, wastewater permitting rules. The community could benefit from additional outreach uh, and education about septic system maintenance, permitting and rules, but it's difficult to reach and engage people. 
As the town looks to improve water quality in the future, engagement of the community will be a continued challenge. So the solutions evaluated. Four solutions. Starting with land conservation, which is our, our June 18th meeting. The entire inner bay is comprised of 289 properties exceeding a value of $72 million. The option of purchasing and conserving the entirety of the inner bay is not feasible given this considerable cost. For this reason, the commission looked at a subset of the area, though it was recognized that a limited land conservation initiative may not solve the wastewater pollution problem. The conservation of lakeside properties, 126 parcels, has an estimated assessed value exceeding 38 million. These properties need to be purchased and conserved over a set time period through conceptual pur purpose, purchase, if possible, or eminent domain should consensus fail. Using a 50-year time horizon and 126 just lakefront properties along West Lakeshore Drive and East Lakeshore Drive and Goodsell Point, approximately two and a half properties would have to be purchased and restored to natural shoreline each year. Using an average property value of the 126 properties, which is $303,000, an annual purchase fund approximating <coughs> $759,000 is required to acquire approximately two properties a year over those 50 years. So we tried to break it out into a longer time frame that could make it more manageable. Uh, total annual costs would need to be in excess of 909000 to support this conservation effort, exceeding $45 million in direct costs, excluding lost grand list value. Eminent domain cases and increases property values over time would substantially increase required funds. The character of the properties adjacent to the conserved land would see positive impacts in that their lake views could potentially improve additional public use. Recreation green areas could potentially be created and the vehicle transportation networks will have greater lake views. While the character of the neighborhood could be a benefit to this option, including opening lake views and potentially adding recreational areas, there needs to be consideration for potential increase in use of these new recreational areas. Further, with land purchases and the relocation of residents from these parcels, there might be negative impacts to businesses and or population within this area as relocations will occur outside the project area and perhaps Colchester. Purchasing and conserving properties in perpetuity is a great way to remove human wastewater source for the inner bay, but there are also considerable disadvantages. First, purchasing the properties requires substantial funding for a great length of time. Townwide increases in taxes would be a primary source of funding, yet may not be considered the best approach by the community. While grant sources were evaluated, there are no sources identified that could regularly provide this level of funding for this project. Finally, it would take many decades to fully purchase the properties. The option is by far the highest cost to the town. This option would take the longest to implement, 50 years. During that implementation, properties with inadequate septic treatment would be still polluting the inner bay. The option would have the highest cost to taxpayers as it would require an increase to taxes while decreasing the grand list and creating a smaller pool of properties to tax. Other options can utilize grant funds as well as generate user fees and other non-taxpayer funds to offset costs. This would not. In looking to the future of Colchester, the Planning Commission found that the land conservation option had many merits, but it's not effective and efficient solution for human wastewater pollution in the inner bay. During this project, the Commission learned of previous land conservations within the community. No local conservation fund currently exists in Colchester. Community septic. Um, what you have on here is the Bayside Hazlet piece and a design that one of our consultants came up with for how a community system could be fitted on that field you see in blue on the inset, as well as pictures of our septic tour. The Integrated Water Resources Management Plan provide information as to how community septic could be used and where, based upon conditions assessment, information on permits and sample test sites. Task 4, the Integrated Water Resources Management Plan, states that community septic was perhaps viable along the non-lakeside section of East Lakeshore Drive at one location in the Goodsell Point area. No community septic areas were deemed viable within the West Lakeshore Drive area. A survey was mailed to property owners along East Lakeshore Drive, did not yield that any property owners with appropriate land were willing to consider a community septic solution on their property. The owners of the Goodsell Point property initially responded to the survey 
but a request to do on-site investigations of the soil was not granted. Review of previous septic permits within the area yielded an estimate that the site might be capable of supporting a 3,000 gallon per day system at best with over 16,000 gallons per day required to serve existing needs. With no privately owned sites available for community septic on East Lakeshore Drive, the town owned Bayside Hazel piece was evaluated. This 14 acre parcel was purchased by the town wide boat uh, with an approved bond in 2004 for $1.1 million. The site is currently vacant. However, significant planning has been undertaken by the town to identify recreational needs and program specific recreational elements and transform the site into a park. Craig Kendall, a hydrologist, was hired to evaluate if the property could accommodate the 120,000 gallons per day of wastewater identified as necessary to serve the area in the 2019 sewer project. While some members of the public debated if, it was, if the gallonage was excessive, the 120,000 gallons would serve properties in the inner bay, and Handel's report affirmed that the site could be capable of treating within the range of 100,000 gallons per day. This is 20% less than the amount necessary to serve the entire area, but the commission believed that this solution was worthwhile investigating given the limited community septic options. Community septic system would require a small wastewater treatment plant to be constructed. The permitting design and construction would take three to five years to complete. The plant would have to be staffed to meet regulatory requirements. Stabilization of the shoreline of, the pro of this portion of the property on the opposite side of the road along the lake would be need needed to address the 100,000 gallons per day of wastewater moving through the soils that could destabilize the land, adding additional costs based upon other stabilization projects in the area. We didn't investigate fully how much it would cost. Systems treating over 50,000 gallons per day of effluent um, as necessary to meet the needs of the area would be required to have tertiary treatment by the state of Vermont to remove the majority of phosphorus. If several smaller systems were built upon this site, the threshold for tertiary treatment would still be necessary, as the state would consider it all one system. I think we encountered questions of could we build it in phases or bit by bit, but you eventually hit that need for tertiary treatment. The state would require it at some point. Um, we looked at the estimated cost of construction, additional in addition, an ongoing uh, cost of approximately, we estimated to be a $250,000 per year would be needed to run the plant, sludge removal, staffing, and required testing. The options to construct were estimated to be around $17,550,000. Concerns were raised by the commission that the development of a community system on the Bayside Hazel piece could conflict with park planning for the site. While some systems can allow for general playing fields on top of the leach field, the presence of a system would constrain the recreational use of the area. There are also concerns that the chance of malfunction and smells associated with the operation of the system, specifically sludge removal, would negatively impact the neighborhood. The ability of property owners to utilize off-lot solutions may increase the rate of growth, potentially impacting the character of the neighborhood. The existing rate of growth for the area is about half a percent or less than one dwelling per year. Even if the solution was to double that rate, it could be a very low and slow build out for the area. There are concerns that the additional growth would cause adverse impacts such as traffic. Zoning, particularly for East Lakeshore Drive, was identified in the 2019 town plan as needing additional review by the commission within two years of adoption of the plan. As I mentioned, this is one of your next priorities. The commission heard concerns about the increased rate of growth within the West Lakeshore Drive area, although this area has had recent zoning changes with Lakeshore 1, Lakeshore 2 being recently adopted by the planning commission. At the conclusion of the project, the commission has identified that it should work with the select board to implement the regulatory measures necessary to minimize unwanted impacts um, such as too much residential or commercial growth or conversions. Zoning would continue to limit the possible uses and determine how many total units could be built. Building caps or other gross man growth management tools could be enacted for the inner bay to help address growth concerns. Solution could maintain and improve water quality for both current and future uses, although it would be limited to 100,000 gallons per day, most likely and the scope of the system might not be sufficient to serve future land use needs. The solution is efficient in that it treats wastewater close to where it comes from. However, the solution is also expensive and requires considerable oversight to operate reliably. 
As with any plant, the community would require a monitoring system, upgrades, replacement, and maintenance with routine testing to ensure that when breakdowns or failures occur, water quality and surrounding properties are not impacted. The property values in the immediate area of the facility could be impacted. The construction and operation of a community system could be paid for by grant, user fees, and non-tax revenue. Incremental grant list growth could possibly impact property taxes. Operating costs could be paid by user fees. While there is public comment that the community system could be sized at a much smaller scale, thus avoiding the cost of tertiary treatment, it was unclear to the commission how this could be fairly achieved and adequately address water quality. State wastewater rules and regulations restrict enforcement of on-site wastewater failures to systems that are surfacing or backflowing into properties. The Integrated Water Resources Management Plan and follow-up of water quality testing provided the greatest amount of information likely to be known on wastewater systems and risk. More specific testing as to what properties have deficient systems is not feasible and it's not probable to further isolate problem properties. With known high-risk areas, even if the worst sites could be identified and solved a limited community system to create a limited community system, there would likely be as many new failures to solve shortly thereafter. It's also unlikely that these failures would be grouped together to provide cost savings in the piping needed to service. If a system was built without tertiary treatment then expanded, additional treatment measures would be necessary at additional cost. A system built incrementally could increase costs and new demands placed on the system and create delay. The Bayside Hazlet piece would likely not yield enough wastewater capacity for a community system that could address existing flows and limited build out. While the tertiary treatment would be costly, it would be a high form of wastewater treatment that could help ensure the wastewater is discharged as clean as possible should there be a breakdown or failure. All right. Sewer, halfway through. 2019 proposed sewer propo project was the source of information used for this option. Project would connect all properties within the inner bay to municipal sewer. The town's existing sewer system is served by the South Burlington Airport Wastewater Treatment Plant. The South Burlington plant has tertiary treatment, no discharges of untreated wastewater. The facility is staffed by wastewater operators a 2.2-mile force main would be installed to extend the service to the, from the inner bay to its current location at Severance Corners, as shown here. The South Burlington plant has recently upgraded and expanded and does not require modifications to take the proposed 120,000 gallons per day of wastewater. The original funding package for the construction of the sewer was a 15% local option tax, 25% grant, 60% loan. After the lot was to be repaid by user fees, 75% of the cost would be paid by users and 25% by grant. No property taxes would have been used with a significant amount of lot funds still available to other projects during that time. The lot, when repaid, would be available for other town needs. Operating costs would be paid by user fees. Similar to the community septic, there'd be a potential for an increased rate of growth in some grand list growth. The existing rate of growth for the area being about half a percent or less than one dwelling a year. Even if the solution were to double that rate, it'd still be a very low and slow build out of the area. There would be no impact to property taxes as the project has identified funding sources of grants, user fees, and local option funds. The commission should work with the select board to implement any regulatory measures necessary to minimize unwanted impacts of too many residential units or conversions. Zoning, similar to the community's septic solution, could be used to limit the possible uses and determine how many units total could be built. Building caps or other growth management tools could be enacted for the inner bay to address any concerns. Solution could maintain and improve water quality for both current and future land uses. The solution is efficient and cost effective in that it ties to the town's existing system and does not require the construction of a treatment plant or area. The sewer option is also highly reliable as it is used as an existing plant and only obligates the town to the maintenance of pump stations. The construction and operation of a sewer system could be paid for by grants, user fees, non-tax revenue. Incremental grant list growth may potentially positively impact property taxes. Operating costs could be paid by user fees. Public concerns noted about the financing of the project are noted in the problem statement in the report and could be addressed if this option were to be considered.
last, no option. And this is a site in Colchester uh, on East Lakeshore Drive. This option includes the status quo and the do nothing approach that came out of the May 20th forum. The no action option was evaluated as a baseline comparison for the other options identified to remediate human wastewater pollution in the Bay. The no action option was defined as maintaining the status quo, including continuing ongoing water quality monitoring and enforcement of septic related public health and safety regulations. During the course of the commission's public outreach, despite the four years and $2 million of integrated water resources management plan study, there were calls to conduct additional study on the scope of the problem and delay action. In evaluating the septic solutions other communities have implemented, it's evident that Colchester's study of the problem far exceeds that of other communities that have moved forward constructing wastewater improvements. This was evident in our September 6 tour. The commission agreed to reflect the sentiment for more information in this report. However, the commission noted that additional education about all the studies and work to date may address these concerns sufficiently. The primary advantage of the do nothing approach is that no additional cost is incurred by the town. This no action approach aligns with a recent town vote which did not approve the sewer proposal. Some of the public sentiments that we received over the course of this project include that the sewer community septic projects are too expensive, the cost and benefit of a sewer system are not fairly aligned among all, better enforcement efforts could identify and hold polluters accountable, the sewer proposal was only a partial fix to the Bay pollution problem. More monitoring data is needed to determine the best solution. The opportunity cost of spending funds on this project is too great versus other priorities. Better septic technologies might be developed in the future. Concerns about new development or redevelopment if new wastewater treatment solutions is made available. While the town has undertaken considerable and comprehensive water quality initiatives, not all community members are aware of these efforts. It's clear that the community members believe that the town's enforcement abilities to be greater than that allowed by law. It's of note that the Colchester has a higher level of wastewater enforcement than any other on-site municipality in the state of Vermont. The only power available to the town that has not availed itself of yet is a point of sale inspection requirement. Such a regulatory requirement could help to identify deficient systems as part of the property transaction process precipitating upgrades. While the town could still not require deficient but not yet failing systems to be replaced, the hope would be that there could be market pressures to improve systems to increase market viability akin to putting a new roof on a home prior to a sale. To recommend that the town investigate and point of sale inspection requirement as another tool to gradually improve water quality system or wastewater systems. The cost of inaction is considerable. The Bay will continue to experience frequent unsafe levels of E. coli and other pathogens as well as other harmful nutrient loading as a result of failed systems in an identified high risk area. The threat to health and safety impacts recreation and enjoyment of our natural resources and limits economic activity beneficial to the community. Should the problem persist or worsen, further economic impacts are possible such as lower property values and decreases in tourism related revenues. Considering the deterioration of water quality in the Bay, we don't have time to choose the no action option, even if people would like to have more data. Colchester spent four years, $2 million, doing more research than any other town in the state in similar position. Conducting more stays now is a waste of public funds and ultimately does not provide a solution to the problem of pollution. In a few decades, the water quality will decrease property values along the lakeshore, decrease tourism revenue, lower the rate of economic activity in the area, and be much more expensive to clean up than it is now. And again, this is the draft report that I'm reading from, which there are some copies of available in the back. There's also um, available online. So the draft findings and conclusions for tonight, and this is part of a public process. Um, so this is again draft. Um, should be noted, there's a common misperception amongst participants in the public process that properties with failing wastewater systems could be identified by the town and thus either enforced against or made a priority to purchase. Under state law, the town does not have the authority to test private wastewater systems or enter upon 
private property for these purposes. A wastewater system can only be considered fail if it's surfacing or backflowing to the property. Marginal systems that do not visibly discharge human waste in the bay are therefore impossible to isolate and then under state law cannot be held accountable or made to comply with current wastewater standards. With the state's limited definition of failure and the town's lack of authority to enter private property, additional enforcement, staff, or site visits will not identify pollution sources or solve the current problems. With the majority of participants in the process, while the majority of participants in the process did not debate the pollution problem, the scope of the problem and the solutions were often called into question. Many participants in the process thought that the town could create its own rules and could increase enforcement to solve pollution problems. The town has sought additional powers from the state to control the operation of wastewater systems only to be denied the ability to be more restrictive than the state rules. Failed systems do not have to meet current state standards and can be best fixed. That means that they do not have to meet standards for setbacks to water bodies, groundwater, or other dimensional standards. Innovative alternative systems are often used as best fixed systems, and there is confusion about how these systems function. Innovative alternative systems can provide a high level of wastewater treatment when designed to state standards. Innovative alternative systems that are used for best fixes for failures are not built to these standards and will not provide the same high level of treatment. The Commission conducted a septic solutions workshop on July 2nd that helped to educate the community on wastewater rules and permitting requirements. Only about 20 members of the community attended this workshop, demonstrating that more work is needed on engagement and outreach. It's evident that not all community members are aware of the town's comprehensive water quality improvement initiatives. The sentiment that the wastewater project was being done at the expense of other water quality projects was also evident amongst public input during this project. The sewer project was not viewed as being a component of a larger water quality initiative. It's clear that community members believe that the town's enforcement abilities could be greater than allowed by law. It's of note that Colchester has the highest level of wastewater enforcement. More education and outreach around the town's current wastewater efforts and plans could engage the community in understanding the need and scope of these improvements. The Commission also heard concerns about the scope of the wastewater problem. The IWRMP and follow-up on water quality testing has provided the greatest amount of information likely to be known on wastewater systems and risk. More specific testing to the projects, to properties that have deficient systems is not feasible. It's not probable to further isolate problem properties within the known high risk area. Even if the worst sites were identified and solved through a limited community system, there would still be likely many new failures that you would then need to address. With three or more times the failure rate of wastewater systems elsewhere in Colchester, the inner bay poses the highest risk in Colchester. During the course of this seven month project, at least four additional wastewater failures occurred in the study area the majority of which were not among, along the lakeside. The additional study contemplated under the no action option will serve only to delay the needed solutions and inflate the cost to implement. The land conservation option would be the most expensive option and would not address the entire inner bay. With 50 years to fully implement a partial land conservation option, not all wastewater pollution sources would be solved. Where removing development and restoring the land would serve to improve water quality to the greatest extent, a limited program would not yield the results necessary to maintain and improve water quality in an efficient and cost-effective manner. There would be both benefits and detractions to the character of the neighborhood as structures are removed, improving views, but also removing the fabric of the neighborhood. Impacts to property values and taxes would be both substantially negative reliability would only come with full removal of all possible wastewater pollution sources that would not be achieved by the project as proposed. Again, we were just looking at the lakeside properties. The community septic solution may yield close to the flows necessary to sustain the inner bay, but would introduce a wastewater treatment plant with ongoing liabilities immediately adjacent to the bay. It, would not, it was not clear that this option would provide sufficient capacity to address all the properties in the inner bay and fully maintain and improve water quality for both current and future land uses and site conditions. The need for a stabilized slope, continuing monitoring was concerning with the potential impacts to neighbors as the operation of the plant, specifically sledge removal. You periodically have to go and 
much like a septic tank, pump these things out and remove the sludge, could devalue adjacent properties. The construction of the $17 million facility would have an ongoing estimated annual operating cost of $250,000. While non-taxpayer funds could be sought to construct and operate the system, or the project is not cost effective. Incremental grandless growth may serve to improve tax liabilities. Substantial oversight would be needed to put into place and ensure the solution would be reliable and efficient. Concerns were raised by the commission that the development of a community system on the Bayside Hazel piece would conflict with the park planning for the site. While some systems could allow for general playing fields, the presence of a system would really constrain the recreational use of the site. Let me go back to the steps. Sorry, I advanced too soon. Sewer option would address the entirety of the inner bay and could maintain and improve water quality for both current and future land uses and site conditions as sources of human wastewater pollution would be removed from the area. This option would extend the town's existing system that utilizes the wastewater treatment facility in Burl South Burlington. It's effective and reliably operated. The least expensive of the actual solutions, the sewer option, is a cost effective and would have an impact similar to community septic would have possible incremental development and grandless growth. Funding sources could be non-property tax-based with options for grants, user fees, and local options. For these reasons, the sewer option is within this draft report the preferred solution identified by the Planning Commission as the most effectively addressing human wastewater pollution in the inner bay. The Commission recommends the Select Board consider additional outreach and education regarding, regarding its current waste current water quality efforts, as well as addressing development concerns prior to further development of a wastewater solution. Again, this is the draft report. So next steps, public comment. That's why you're having the meeting tonight, to receive comments. There were some comments that were um, submitted shortly before the meeting that you have paper copies of. There are a few paper copies in the back. We'll look to try and get those in the pack information online as soon as possible. Um, public comments on the draft are welcomed um, by those that can attend tonight's meeting until the 13th of December. Um, you've identified that you'll receive your comments at that December 17th meeting. Um, look to finalize the report at your meeting on January 7th, and then hopefully present the report to the select board in January 2020. Very good. Very good. As you can see, it's very complicated. We went through step by step. Um, are there any comments tonight from our audience tonight on this project? Come right up. If you come up to the microphone, please, and state your name um, so we can all hear you. My name is Charles ISF. Uh, I'm interested, is this part of a comprehensive solution? Because I gather this is not the answer to the wastewater problem. So Am I incorrect? This is our best I'm just solution. A, this is our best advice for what we've learned over the last few months. Okay, but is this the end of? In other words, this is what we're going to be doing to address the wastewater so problem. So this is the Planning Commission was tasked by the Select Board with evaluating the different options. They're going okay. to present their findings to the Select Board, and then the Select Board and the town will eventually have to choose what they do with this information. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Comments tonight? No? Oh. Thank you. My name is Tom Barry. I live on Sawmill Road. Um, and uh, I'll probably submit some written comments too, just off the cuff tonight. First of all, compliments to the town and the planning commission. It's a very substantial undertaking um, and not something we see every day on uh, uh, public infrastructure projects. Uh, a lot of work went into this, and so I compliment you for that. Um, on quick first read of it, I, I would suggest that if you do revisions, um, you do a bit more work on the problem statement. Um, in looking at the problem statement tonight, the, um, the only actual statement that there is a substantial problem with E. coli contamination in the inner bay is um, a quote from the state that there's a higher than expected source signal in Mallets Bay. And then the problem statement goes on to review a lot of studies and uh, conclusions about solutions, but 
in my quick first read, and maybe there's more in here, the only actual statement that there is a smoking gun of E. coli contamination in the inner bay is a higher than expected source signal. But then from that, it's concluded later on in the report under the um, no action alternative that the bay will continue to experience frequent unsafe levels of E. coli bacteria and other pathogens. It may be that the bay is experiencing frequent unsafe levels, but probably it would be good to substantiate that in the problem statement if it's then the basis for conclusions later in the report. Um, also in the no action alternative, it's stated that harmful nutrient loading as a result of failed septic systems will continue in the high risk area. And um, connecting the dots between a failed septic system and nutrient loading to Lake Champlain is something that the current total maximum daily load plan for phosphorus, the main nutrient of concern in, the, in Lake Champlain, does not do. And so if this report is going to draw that line between failed septic systems and nutrient loading, again, that would probably be good to state up front um, with some evidence in the problem statement. Um, and so th those are a couple of areas. And then um, it also says that deterioration of water quality in the bay um, will continue. That implies that there's sort of a, a linear acceleration of the condition of the bay deteriorating. And again, um, there's no evidence offered in the problem statement that things are getting worse. And again, I assume that among all the studies, and I'm aware of some of them, the, the evidence is there. So there could probably be a stronger linkage between the problem statement and then the conclusions that are drawn later in the report. But um, I'll look at the report and provide some more written uh, input. But those are a, a few things that occurred to me on, on first read. And again, uh, uh, really kudos to the, the town and the planning commission for the amount of work that's gone into this and that uh, remains to be done. Thank you. Great, thank you. All good? How about the commission? Any comments on our end? I think there's some cleanup that still needs to be done, but we can. There's a lot of cleanup, and I know you have your grammatical changes. Sarita had a few for me, too. Yeah, so, but that can be handled. I mean, there's nothing in the report that I would want to make changes to, just some cleanup. This is also very draft. It's very boring and black and white and no graphics. We will look to definitely beef it up. Yeah, no, thank you to Sarah, the staff, because this was, I mean, what, 13 pages, but seven months of a lot of your work bringing it to us, a lot of consultant work, a lot of uh, knowledge that you brought uh, in front of us that helped us identify this. And I feel 100% confident moving this forward and recommending, it, recommending this to the uh, select board uh, at our January meeting. Mark, all good? Yeah, no comments. All good? I am very happy with everything we've got so far tonight. And if everybody's happy, I'm ready to move on. I well, guess. we uh, definitely, if people want to, I know that some people have very icy driveways tonight um, and haven't gone fully cleared out and we're not able to make it for health reasons, what have you, but um, there is the public comment period until the 13th. Um, happily, if anybody submits it through our office, through email, yeah. Uh, we'll get that to you. We'll, I'll put it into the packet, and Great. we'll consider all then. Fantastic. All right, we're off and running. Thank you. Oh, go right ahead. Come on up. Give me a quick. Let me move on. <coughs> um, Lynn Letary from Pine Meadow Drive, and my concern is. Um, twice before a sewer has been recommended and twice before it has been voted down. How, <laughs> if this is recommended again and if it's brought up for a vote again, what is the plan for preventing it from being voted down again? You know, a lot of time and effort and money has gone into all of the studies and the planning and the thinking, um, I would hate to see this come to the same conclusion. Leave that aside for a second. 
I don't understand the um, connection between the wastewater efforts and the stormwater efforts. Are they linked? Um, does the sewer address any of the stormwater at all, or is that strictly a matter of, um, you know, human waste completely? Thank you. So I'll take a stab at that. Um, Colchester has a comprehensive water quality initiative that is looking at all aspects of water quality, wastewater, stormwater, um, and the sewer project was a component of that. I, I think as our public works director, which can describe these projects and how they're constructed a lot better than I can, uh, put it is, when you tear up a road, you only want to do it once. <laughs> we tore up West Lakeshore Drive every other year, people would get really mad at us. And so the plan was that um, when the road was torn up to put sewer in, is that they would avail themselves of that opportunity to also address a lot of the storm drains and lines and construction that needed to occur on top of that. But you put a sewer in on the bottom because it needs to not freeze. So that needs to go the deepest and then storm more and then other utilities on top. So it, in looking at it sort of as a comprehensive package, the sewer needed to go first. So there are plans to address stormwater efforts as well, um, but those were not specifically part of the sewer project, but they were sort of trying to be timed sequentially with that. And so I think that's still a big question that's hanging out there is, um, depending on which way this project could go is um, in terms of the timeline with stormwater. Now that has not held back a lot of these stormwater projects. I know Shore Acres was undertaken this summer or late, late summer, early fall. Um, and there still are projects that are moving forward um, in terms of remaining some of the stormwater solutions. But it's a very tight space along East and West Lakeshore Drive that you have to work with. Um, and so I know that the, there were plans to try and make the most use of it. Um, and I think your points are well taken in terms of um, what to do if this is brought up again. I'm not sure that we have a solution for that, but that's a very good point. This gave an opportunity for people that did vote down to have an opportunity to provide us with an alternative to the sewer. And that's really what we're looking for, is something besides the sewer. Could we bring something to you that was better than the sewer? Or Zico, I think as a planning commission, we, after all this, we just decided sewer still came to the top for our best bet. Yeah, come on up. Carol Reichert, 388 Annis Court. Uh, I think it's up to us, the people that are in favor of the Planning Commission recommendation to get the other people that don't come because you all make great efforts to put the word out that these things are happening. So it, it's not just your responsibility to make these things succeed, it's the rest of ours also who are, happen to be in support of your recommendations. Thank you. All said. Go fire. To be continued. There you go. Thank you again. Thank you. Do you want a two minute break while we let the room clear? Zoning Supplement 42. All righty. Let me go back to my notes here. So I included some information for you, uh, and we can go to them about um, noise levels and some of the decibel chart, um, because there are some questions from the last meeting about noise and noise levels. Um, 
the supplement hasn't changed since that time, but just wanted to take a chance and walk through any questions that you have. Try to address some of your questions about like noise and what is, you know, I, I was amazed at um, a regular office setting has 60 to 65 decibels. You can reach that in just a saying like this. Um, so that was about decibels. And then we did get a um, letter back from our town attorney about footprint lots and some of the things that are recommended within the draft, which hopefully we can look to try and incorporate in that um, supplement. So some adding of language in different areas, a little bit of wordsmithing. Um, and that was the whole um, drive where we should recognize footprint lots because that's where the housing market is going in terms of recognizing for financing purposes. Um, so it's something that's been happening, but we want to better define what exactly is a footprint lot versus a regular lot. Um, and that while you might have a footprint lot for ownership or for financing purposes, it's not for something for your setbacks. So I think the town attorney uh, draft was actually fairly straightforward. Yeah, uh, that's just one thing that was confusing to me. And maybe it was just the way it was, we kind of read it in, uh, let's see, what do you, you see? See, yeah, see, there at the end. Yep. It says the footprint lots shall be adequately sized so as to contain a building and all expected appurtenances, uh, such as stairs, patios, egress windows, bulkheads, decks, HVAC units, etc., but shall not extend more than two feet beyond the building. When I read it, I'm thinking. Okay, some of these things, like the stairs and patios, extend more than two feet from the building. I think the idea was that the footprint lot should not extend for more than then, two feet beyond then, the building, including the stairs, patios, what have you. So you might wind up with a huge footprint lot. Right. So if we do, you know, use something like this to put it into the supplements. I think we, we can need to add in maybe that. right we can add in maybe a e and have that be a separate i think it would be better phrased if it was a separate and just say footprint lot shall not extend more than two feet beyond the building when all those things are attached a building and all expected appearances that's all part of the building Right, but in the sentence where it, it kind of says contain a, a building and then it says beyond the building, then it's kind of... I, I can clarify that. Yeah, what, everything we need to. What's the purpose of the law extending two feet beyond those, those items? So you did wind up with a footprint lot, again, just for ownership issues that was twice the size that was needed. Okay. Um, so why not the actual limit of those items versus two feet beyond those items just because never nothing's ever exact <laughs> particularly with building um you know I, I think two feet is normally like the roof clearance on it's a lot a of roof. buildings it's also footings underground you got yep. things happening there so two feet kind of gives you a little buffer we'll clarify that And the same comment is <clears throat> on the next page is talking about the same section. It just repeats it. That's all. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on the attorney opinion? That was pretty thorough. Any questions on chainsaw or Walkman noises or I, I miss Prish having Prissa here I was going to ask her if she knew what Walkman was um, <laughs> <laughs> I think we all remember um, it's called earbuds now I guess okay <laughs> they're, they're re-releasing it for the 40th anniversary 
Fantastic. Really? Sony is, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think I threw mine away. <laughs> Probably a collector's item. Well, what's what's the number? What's the <laughs> number that we're using in the rigs? On. So for undeveloped tracts of land over a one hour average, so 70. So you can operate your chainsaw for a brief period of time, but if it's sustained. And then we were looking at for developed areas for that one hour period too, um, during most daytime hours, 75, evening hours, 45. Um, develop lands, properties um, that aren't residential. These are more of the general development districts. Um, you're looking at 75. So still relatively low thresholds, but again, this is a one hour average. And this only applies to things that are permitted by the DRB. So if your friends have a wild party, we can't enforce underneath this. It's really just um, if you had a business that we approved as an office that was continuing throwing office parties that were very loud, we could, or a factory that was producing a lot more noise at the property lines than allowed under this. Um, So if you had someone who had, you know, not that there's that many lots here in Colchester, but like a logging operation, which would make a lot of noise, mm -hmm. it'd be making more than 75, but does it fall? This is at the property lines too, for one hour, one hour average at the property lines. So, so if you have a large lot that you're logging and you're on the interior of it. Okay. We very rarely get things that we need to enforce under this. And just, I, I think the intent of it right now was um, we don't have this one hour average or a time period. We have just a decibel level, which is very hard to enforce. So I, I think the major change here is looking to have the time period and a one hour average as opposed to being just a sudden instant. and also to bring in line a little bit better with what current standards are, if we are going to be taking a look at a one hour average. When we take a look at what is 70 decibels, well, a normal conversation right now is 60 to 70. Any other questions on the supplement? Are there any other changes different than our last review? No. I didn't hear anything else. Looking good? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. It's a beautiful thing. All right, so we just move right on. We have approval from minutes of November 5th. Let me find those things. Let's see. Make a motion first. Yeah. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of November 5th, 2019. I'll second. Discussion. Okay. Not. Never mind. Okay. All right. All right. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Whatever. Back to information. What was there? 
So you had two things. You had um, a notice from Aegis about 3943 Roosevelt Highway. Okay, yeah. Transformer thing? A solar. Okay. And then you had um, a letter asking about rezoning in the fort. That was interesting. That was a temp change. Is that common? Fort's a little bit all over the map. Yeah. It's one of those historic areas that when it was sort of an adaptive reuse and coming out, a lot of things happened out there that may or may not have been ever very well tracked. So um, I think it's too late for this supplement. I'm not sure when your next supplement's going to be. I don't know what you'd like me to communicate back if this is something that you're willing to have them come in and speak to at some point or can you can you just give like a five second like broad overview of what he's trying to explain so right now uh storage and warehousing is not an allowed use or a conditional use in the fort mm -hmm. the fort is general development too it allows for a range of everything from residential to some industrial to commercial and um Mini storage is allowed in very few areas in Colchester. It's allowed in our industrial and business districts um, because most mini storage is new prefab metal buildings. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that one of the reasons why it wasn't considered for use mm -hmm. in the fort was because of the historic nature of the fort. This is a little bit of a different circumstance because they're dealing with an existing building that they want to use for this purpose. Um, so right now, um, storage such as this is not either a permitted or a conditional use. It's just not allowed. So in order for them to expand, they're stuck. And, and why, why is he bringing up the back and forth all the way back to 1969? I, I think just to show some of the history that it was used uh, and unfortunately, they've lost rights to okay. that, but um, they are looking at, they want to expand their storage use, and they um, can't. They aren't set up for any kind of storage, just mini storage. So it, it's storage units within an existing building. Right. And so they're not like mini storage, they're like, there's like a door on a Correct. space. Yeah, it's I don't know it's conditioned. Some of it's conditioned storage so that it's not a cold storage. Right. So if someone has legal papers or something, they can store it there and know that it's not going to deteriorate. Right. And there's, as they said, there's very few places in the area that provides this. Yep. So, and it's interesting that when they started this business, it was zoned industrial and then they rezone it so they can sell furniture. I guess um, for our next supplement. Yeah. Right? And we'll let them know when we get a little bit closer on that. Right. I mean, right now he's using it, he's, he is using it as a storage. Mm -hmm. um, sounds like he just wants to expand it. He has a leased space right. in there. We're doing another supplement eventually. Yep, you, you guys are, go. you guys have a lot on your plate right now. Correct. All right. That was it for packet information. All right. See, Burlington just gave me something tonight, but that's going to be for your next packet. So um, you do not have a meeting for your first meeting in December. You've opted to only have the one meeting in December and that's gonna be on the 17th. So again, next meeting, December 17th. We'll have all the comments back from the public. Oh, I hope there's more. You already had those three submitted yeah. tonight, but. Okay. All right, we have a motion to adjourn. 
I'll make an motion to adjourn the meeting. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.